but Whale. If I burn down the pub, then where will the Loyalists use as their base? Uh, we'll talk later. Welcome back to Let's Play Dishonored. I'm Burning Dog Base. And last time, we got this creepy ass thing from a charming gentleman called the Outsider, who also gave us, oh holy shit, magic. And the power to teleport, which I can only imagine will be very useful in evading guards. I haven't actually tried dark vision yet. Oh, what the hell. Oh! Oh, this is very interesting. Away so it doesn't drive me nuts. But yes, I am surrounded by the Voidwalker's arsenal. And uh, as near as I can figure out, each one of these clusters of things, you know, a book, a pouch of dollary dues, uh, some bone charms, and a mystical something artifact, each of these represents one of the different store's pre order bonuses. You know, get it at GameSpot, get the, get the whale, get it at, uh, I don't know, a feature shop, and get the uh, mystical wolfhound. But the Voidwalker's Arsenal DLC, which was officially released as a buyable package more than a year after the game came out, uh, gives you all of them. Let's just get on with it. Uh, I don't know exactly what a bone charm is, so I'm going to start over here and see if I can figure it out. Bone charms. Bone charms provide small supernatural benefits. Locate them for listening for the song they emit. By default, you can activate up to three bone charms at once in the bone charm section of the journal. Which brings me to the point I was trying to make there. Uh, Raven, drop assassination gives you a bit of health. Okay, then. You see there at the bottom? Well, I have three slots for bone charms, but, uh... Ultimately up to ten. Well, as I understand it... The most notable part of the Voidwalker's arsenal is the statues, because each one of them gives you an additional bone charm slot. And since I have all four of these uh, you know, bonus collections, that's kind of uh, overpowered. I couldn't say I'd be able to equip you know, all three of these and another one if I wanted to. Okay, let's just get them all and see what they do. Oh, the list of the names over at the side. Good Lungs, Voyeur, I saw that. Fencer. Blast Resistant. Firewater, I have to know. Okay. Uh, hmm. River Affinity. Swim speed increased slightly. Quick dodge. Enemies miss more often with arrows and bolts. Delicate touch. Breaking glass sound is moderately reduced. Voyeur. Moderate keephole peeping magnification. Good Lungs. Breath capacity in water increased slightly. Fencer. Win sword versus sword contests more re frequently. Blast resistant. Damage from explosions reduced slightly. Fire water. Shoot whiskey. Shot whiskey bottles explode with greater intensity. I didn't know they did, but okay. Occultist. Collect ten bone charms. Well, not much I can do about that. White Rat's Friend. White Rats won't attack you. 
Gutter Feast. White rats can be consumed for mana. Void Channel. Power effects slightly improved. Well, that seems pretty straightforward. Uh... Alright, I'm going to start with these three. Each of the four things is a different name, by the way, the four packs, but I don't know what they are, and more importantly, I don't know which is which. Fine, we'll just pick one and uh, read it at random. We'll go with the fish one. The journey, the journal of Granny Rags. Excerpt from the rambling is of a street denizen. Why would someone write this down and make it a book? Of course I'll tell you, dearie. I won't keep any secrets from you in the end. All the dreary days of my life are like the windows of a house. From the kitchen I can see out into the garden where the leaves and stalks are brown and bug-eaten. You can see a little lump of dirt where something was wrapped in a blanket and laid to rest along the rows of twisting vines. The front room looks out into the street where the neighbors are all setting fire to their homes, barricading themselves inside. Warm and snug, dearie. Don't forget about the bedroom, either. It sees into a dreary alley where hooligans are playing a game with an old man. The first two are hitting him with sticks, and the girl with them is kicking at his dry old ribs. Oh, to have those bones, to boil them in a pot. No one lives in my house anymore, dearie. No one you'd want to meet. When I lived there with my husband, we were fine. Fine people. Vera Moray, everyone would say. Your house is as grand as Boyle Manor. Better even. Your dinners are lavish and your parties are the best. When that young Sokolov came to paint my portrait, I was nearly still in my prime. Radiant, he said, and he was just barely a man, so young, painting all the best people across the land. Everyone wanted a portrait by his hand. All my friends. I was the only one, dearie, wet with his paint, glistening on the canvas for a pretty coin. But it wasn't all parties and paintings. My husband and I weren't always at home, no. We traveled together, he and I, to the far ends of the Isles. Beyond, even, all the way to the red cliffs of Pandicia, to dig in the rock and crawl through the caves, holding up candles and squinting at the walls many precious things we came upon, but none so precious as the boy with the black eyes, dearie. All those marks and bones carved so deep and polished so bright. I brought the old bones home, hid them from my dear little, from my dear husband. Then I learned to boil them and carve them myself. They made such good presents, dearie. The little mute boy took them home. He loved them so. All the time, he came back with new bones for me, holding them up so I could see it in his eyes, even though his tongue was still. Granny, his eyes would say to me, carve these bones for me. Make me another present. And he went so far, so far, all the way to Dunwall Tower, the royal headsman himself now, my little mute boy and his shiny, shiny sword. Better bones were what I needed, you see. Better bones to carve and polish, scrape and gleam. My dear old husband was always tired. I made him soup and then he was sick. Better bones was all, for my little mute boy carved in the name of the one with black eyes. And after my husband was gone, given away as birthday gifts, I didn't want to live there anymore. So now I'm old and I don't have many to give my presents to. It's sifting through the garbage for Granny Rags and feeding the little birdies that gather at my feet. No one wants to have tea, dearie. Especially those rude louts on Bottle Street. Slackjaw and his boys, always meddling with an old woman just trying to make her way. In the end, we'll be together with him. You and me in the dreary night with stars above and below. And always the one with the black eyes, dearie. Well, that was unsettling. Um... After having the situation explained to me by the ever-helpful Vulpathrope, I have decided, by the way, not to pick up these artifacts yet. 
If it turns out I totally suck at the game, I might come back and get them. You know, I'm assuming we're going to be coming back to the pub a lot. And if not, here's a special save just for that purpose. But, uh, for now, I'm going to keep uh, going along without getting these. Early Life and Criminal Records Slackjaw. Excerpt from a series of letters sent by a member of the Bottle Street Gang. You want the chin wag on Slackjaw? What he was like when he was young, before he got his name? Oh, he's got a cool head now, but it weren't always like that in the days before he was boss of the Bottle Street Gang. Time was, young Slackjaw wasn't such a reasonable man. Like most of us, he grew up on the streets, running with a pack of ragamuffins and avoiding the law, pinching whatever he needed. Dark haired and dark eyed, smoking a pipe by the age of ten. For them born to the brothels or coming from the orphanages, it was either the gangs or working to the mudlarks, and no one wants that. Some got pressed into the navy or put down in the mines run by the Pendleton or Boyle families. As hard as it was in the streets, as hungry as we all got, at least we was free. By the time we weren't little ones anymore, Slackjaw was the one to watch, usually calling shots when we took down a farmer's cart or sidewalk street vendor. He'd come up with a plan, give everyone some part to play, and decide in the split. Most of us just went along, as we learned fast, so we made out better like that. More food, more coin, plus none of us wanted to deal with Slackjaw when he was in a rage. He was working on a couple of big jobs with Black Sally across town, that was enough to get the attention of the other bosses. He wasn't just a street kid anymore, now he's an up-and-comer, which meant trouble. Another guy who fancied himself as such was Mike the Fish, who was working his way up run, uh, running the protection racket among the factory women. One fine evening, we're all taking in a body show in the theater house. Mike the Fish and his lot are there in the cheap seats, too, just down the aisle from us. Mike gets a wild idea. He wasn't big on planning. And throws a heavy ceramic spittoon, slack jaw. Hits him square in the face and breaks his jaw. We look to see if there's going to be a blood uh, brawl, but slack jaw just points at the door and we all leave, with Mike laughing at our backs. Waking up the next day without telling us why, Slackjaw motions for us to follow. We still can't say a word, so we just come along. We stop at the docks, and Slackjaw buys, actually pays coin for it, a heavy chain covered in hooks. It's for fish in the deep, something you'd attach to a long line off the side of a ship. It's about four feet, made of thick links, and there are shark hooks coming off of it at different angles. Slackjaw's got that thing wrapped around his left arm, dangling at his side. Not sure how he knew where Mike the Fish was staying, but when he reaches girl's house, Slackjaw throws a bottle through the window, just like that. It's almost noon. There's a bunch of screaming inside, and Mike pokes his head out, looking wide-eyed and baffled. When he sees Slackjaw in the street, a look comes over his face that still gives me the willies. Pure murder. Mike comes out the side door, bellowing like a blue ox. Blood ox? Holding a cleaver, heading straight for Slackjaw. When they come together in the street, Slackjaw spins and a shark hook spike deep into Mike's arm and shoulder. He screams, but Slackjaw holds onto the chain. He's standing there with his jaw broken. Clenched tight, with a chain wrapped around his left arm, Hook sunk into Mike the Fish, just knifing him as fast as he can. Mike couldn't fight very well, Hook like that, and using his left hand, but he's a big guy, and it took a lot of stabbing before he went to his knees. Everyone was cheering at first, but then we all went quiet. It just kept going and going, until finally it was just Mike the Fish blubbering, crying like a baby, and a sound of slack jaws knife. When it was over, and here's the brilliant part, Slackjaw took out a note and stuck to Mike's face in the nail. It just said, If you want a job, come to Bottle Street. Slackjaw didn't talk right for a couple of months, but word spread fast. At the end of the year, once he had a sizable gang going, he sent out letters to the other bosses telling them that he was running a brand new crew over on Bottle Street. Most of them laughed or beat up the guys who delivered the letters. Green-eyed Trish even came back missing a thumb. But apparently Slackjaw was expecting that kind of reaction and had a backup plan. A week later, four of the bosses were dead. Seemed like a series of unfortunate events, but everyone knew better. One shot dead by the watch while standing in the middle of a meat market. Another slipping and falling into the water, out cold. One of the older bosses found a bed with his belly opened wide and a Tivian pear stuffed into his mouth. Still not sure what that meant. And Sheila Barnsworth was found bubbling in a cauldron of hot wax. Slackjaw sent out another set of letters, offers to the underbosses, telling them they'd be treated fair as peers. He even sent green-eyed Trish with one of the letters. All of the underbosses accepted. After spilling the guts of his main competition, Slackjaw went in for stabilizing his business, real neat like. Calling in favors, smoothing things over, giving everyone a little bit of coin or drink as a bonus, showing what he could be like as boss. So everything got quiet, which always makes the boys of the city watch nervous, of course. 
Word went out amongst the Royal Spymaster's snitches, the Responsible Citizens group, they called themselves, telling everyone working in a shop or sweeping off the front steps of their homes, keep watchful eyes for Slackjaw and his men, trying to suss out what they were up to and what had just happened. But Slackjaw ain't stupid. He greased a few palms among the shopkeepers and the watch, too, telling that he was in town to stay, and that things would be run properly from now on, without so much blood. He was finally a real boss, ready to settle into the business of moving whiskey, running the hound fights, and offering up the ladies and gentlemen the night, if you take my meaning. Then the plague came. First, it seemed like a good thing. A few people got sick, and everyone wanted to buy those potions from Sokolov or Piero. Health elixir, a spiritual remedy, they call him. Slockjaw told me he saw an opportunity. We already had an old whiskey factory with a still where we could water the stuff down and sell it discounted. Doing the same with Sokolov's elixir was a smart plan. Pretty soon everybody in the slums was sick and business was good. But after a while there were so many people with down with plague that everyone got scared. Everyone started asking, re acting real nasty and everything fell apart. But people can't work. They don't have the coin for elixir, watered down or pure. Oh dear. When the Empress died it seemed like Dunwall would slide into the void. Spymaster Burroughs took over, and the Watch started using all that new Sokolov technology. Watchtowers, tall boys, and MRC pylons. They put up a wall of light across Clavering Boulevard and cracked down hard. But Slackjaw surprised us again. Instead of leaving town on a boat bound for Morley or one of the other isles, he stayed and kept it all together. We get as much elixir to fight off the plague as a city watch with their taxes and rations, and that's kept us alive so far. Crowley, Bottle Street Gang. Well... Field survey notes the Royal Spy, excerpt from the personal memoirs of Hiram Burroughs, dated several years earlier. I'm not gonna try to do that guy's voice, fuck that guy. This is the fourth day, month of high cold. Progress continues on the suppression of gang activity in the distillery district, but more slowly than I expected. These are long, folks, I apologize. I'm gonna get all these in one video, don't worry, uh... Jesus. Maybe I'll make this a special video. I don't fucking know. <laughs> we'll see. Uh... More slowly than I'd expected. The ruffians operating there have been cunning. I'll grant them that, but it's only a matter of time. I'll see their leaders flogged in public and sent beneath the royal executioner's blade. If I had my way, that mute bastard would be lurking night and day, removing the heads that need removing. Internally, the Empress does not seem pleased with my investigations. Wait. Sure, I thought I missed something up there. Uh... Right, right. Internally, the Empress does not seem pleased with my investigations. It seems that it is beyond her thinking, against her very nature as a trusting person, to believe that traitors move among us, but I know they do. They must. No, Jessamine would rather spend her time with the Royal Protector. At least he's likely to stop any immediate threat to her safety, but a strong arm is not what's needed against those who would undermine us. How would Corvo's sword stop a poisoned wine glass or an explosive delivered by courier? It will not. There are many threats around us. Threats requiring meticulous efforts to police. Young lady Emily is undisciplined, I'm afraid. Here within Dunwall Tower, she receives instruction from the finest tutors known in the Isles. Yet her mother spoils her, and she spends most of her time lost in imagination. Wasting her time drawing. Or, acting cor or asking Corvo to teach her to fight with wooden sticks. A girl might rule the Empire someday. Every moment spent at play is a moment wasted. Shoring up security for the main gate leading into Dunwall Tower has been another pet project of late. To think that back in his day, Emperor Caldwin left it open to the public during the day, allowing anyone to come and go as they pleased. If it were up to me, I'd seal off access to the streets entirely, but the Empress won't hear of it. The water locked is much easier to protect, and if it were the only way into the tower, traffic in and out would be greatly reduced. Someday the wrong person is going to slip in and will suffer for it, mark my words. No amount of security is excessive when it comes to protecting heads of state. The Empress also disapproves of my plan with the Sokolov devices. Sokolov himself has no interest in security, of course, but he's vain and therefore keen to see his inventions deployed in any fashion. This wall of light he's been tinkering with has promise. In any case, 
Well, at least I was able to convince the Empress to upgrade the pistols carried by the officers of the watch. <sighs> Why do I worry so when no one else seems to care? If I ever fall asleep, will it all sink into the ocean? Will the rough things clamber over the walls and fill themselves on our flesh? This is what I see in the same dream several times each month. If only I had more say in things, more authority, I could protect us all. Perhaps I've been working too hard. Dinner and an evening of conversation with a certain lady of refinement might be order. Perhaps somewhere nice in the estate district. Hiram Burroughs, Royal Spymaster. Alright, oh, that's a lean button. Why did I think that was the jump button? And finally... Rumors and sightings. Dowd. Excerpts from an overseer's covert field report. For over a year now, I have lived away from the Abbey without the company of my overseer brethren or the guidance of the blind sisters of the oracular order. Days have passed with me sleeping in the dens of cut purses, murderers, and worse, and the knights have seen me prowling through the worst alleys and wretched corners of Dunwall. I have taken my meals with killers. At times I have ventured beyond the city walls, meeting in forgotten graveyards and the outlying ruins frequented by those of ill means. My beard has grown long, and I wear the weathered clothing and bits of boiled leather favored by the Bottle Street and Hatter gangs. and by those rough men and women who make their trade knifing others in return for coin. My hands have run wet red with blood, but it's true, but I have selected my targets with care, choosing among those criminals and heretics who are not fit to live, executing them justly, and using their deaths as a means of building my reputation. So far this trick has allowed me to make my name among my murderous colleagues without taking the lives of the innocent. My goal is singular. I must impress the assassin named Dowd in order to get close to him. Of all the practitioners of black magic we have tracked, none concern the Abbey so much as Dowd. It is said that his mother was a witch from one of the archipelagos off the Pandician coast, taken captive by pirates venturing far from the Isles. According to the, le to the uh, legend, according the legend, according to legend, by the time the ship returned, the captain was dead, and the witch controlled the crew, with Dowd still a shadow in her belly. Hmm. The earliest stories tell of a gang killer without mercy, moving among the shopkeepers and city watch officers of Dunwall like a reaper through wheat. Then a period of silence followed. Years, we now believe, he spent traveling the aisles, spent studying anatomy and the occult in the great halls of learning, and in hidden basements frequented by fellow dabblers in the forbidden arts. Dowd is even purported to have spent a winter in the Academy of Natural Philosophy itself. So I just, I, I, I'm rereading re that bit because I was kind of like reading it while my mind was elsewhere. So I don't think I took any of that in. Uh, okay. And for a time, before a schism developed, he counted the Brigmore Witches among his allies. That is the name of one of the uh, DLC chapters, the Brigmore, the Brigmore Witches. Just thought I'd mention that. All the while, he honed his craft, and it is during this time that we believe he began to consort with the Outsider. New reports emerged of a dusky-skinned assassin, paid by the elite to eliminate their rivals in Dunwall and in the other major cities across the Isles. Those who saw him and lived numbered in the handful, but all of them reported something strange. He appeared and vanished like smoke. From a nearby rooftop, he gestured, and a near noblewoman stumbled from her balcony, falling to her doom on the cobblestones below. Most recently, as this new threat of plague has risen in Dunwall, Dowd has been seen leading, leading a gang of men in dark leather, dressed as factory whalers in their vapor masks. They seem loyal beyond comprehension for one so unworthy, leading me to wonder if some of his magic is dedicated to lulling their minds, enslaving them. Only a, mo a month ago, one young girl claims to have come upon, upon a strange scene. Carrying a bottle of milk home to her crippled brother, she was taking a shortcut through the tailor's district, in a narrow street, she passed beneath a window and heard unusual sounds from within. Pushing aside the ratty curtain, the girl saw into an abandoned apartment, used by miscreants for gambling and trading haberweed. An occult, and trading haberweed. An occult shrine had been erected against the far wall, which she recognized in the teachings given by her local overseer. 
A man she described as resembling Dowd is kneeling before the shrine, muttering to unseen spirit, muttering to an unseen spirit, as if in argument. He took a carving made of pale bone from the altar before him, and the lights all went out in a gush of unclean wind. Quiet as a field mouse, she slipped away, running until she reached her home. There can be no doubt. Dowd is an agent of the outsider and must die, for there is no limit to the evil this man might do. This is my solemn oath and the great purpose of my life. Until Dowd is dead and his corruption has been purged from the world, I will continue to move among the depraved, winding my way towards him. I will not drop my guise or don my overseer's mask again until Dowd breathes no more. Well, shit, does that sound like anyone we've met? Well, this has been an incredibly uneventful uh, video, even for me. Like, I don't think we ever even had one this, you know, where I never left the same room, even in the uh, most wordiest, that's, even in the wordiest of my LPs, like Mars Warlogs. Or, uh, Jason of the Ar not Jason the Argonauts, Rise of the Argonauts. But with all that lore under my belt, I'll just get that for the sake of it. I'm gonna call this one a video, but don't worry, I think I'll do an extra video today to make up for just how, uh, languid the pace of this one was. I'm Burning Dog Face, and I'll see you in the next episode of Let's Play Dishonored, when we actually do something and Corvo leaves his room. Later!